I'm, I'm so glad to have two of my all-time favorite resources for talking about New York politics back on the show. Welcome back, Zoran Mamdani, an assembly member from the great state of New York. How are you doing, Zoran? Doing well. It is always a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And Ross Barkin, a journalist, you know him from his excellent Substack and also uh, writing for New York Magazine. Welcome back, Ross. Thank you for having me. Glad to be on again. So, Ross, I pulled you in because um, you wrote this piece actually for New York Times. Uh, no, sorry. That's a lie. I'm reading a separate article. Um, I'll start that again. Ross, I pulled you in because, first and foremost, you've been covering these New York races so closely. There's a lot that's gone on in New York in the context of midterms. It's become an unexpectedly significant state. I'm a little unsure where to start, so let me just put, lay out the lay of the land so far. For one, there was an unexpectedly strong challenger to the Democratic governor in an ostensibly blue state. A Trump Republican really leaned into the uh, kind of fear-mongering around crime, and people think had some success on that basis. Hochul leaned into that as well. And there's been a lot of um, conversation about whether or not it was an effective strategy, although she managed to pull it out and win in the end. Additionally, the red wave that many people thought was going to materialize did not. And Democrats actually stood a chance of potentially even holding on to the House. Nothing's settled yet, but it looks unlikely that they will do that, even though it's very slim margins, which is giving people more cause to look at New York with more scrutiny because Democrats lost a number of House seats, seats in the state without which they might have actually been able to hold on to the House. Uh, and moreover, there's this broader conversation um, that continues what we talked about last time we were on the show about the utility, the efficacy of Sean Patrick Maloney choosing to basically boost Mondaire Jones out of his seat, which was considered to be an easier seat for him to win, and then subsequently losing that race. So all of that being said, what on earth is going on in New York State? Well, yeah, you you just said it right. Um, I, I you know going into election day, I fully expected Republicans to perform well in New York State, and I extrapolated from that to think, well, they're probably going to perform well everywhere. And it turned out, no. In fact, uh, it was red ripple for the rest of the country and red wave for New York. And a lot went into that. Uh, you you covered some of it. Obviously, you had a incendiary but very disciplined campaign from Lee Zeldin, the Republican candidate who's a Long Island congressman who ran very hard on crime and pretty much only crime for a while as well. He's talking about inflation or vaguely education, but really in the final weeks of the campaign, almost every single day he was calling a press conference around some shooting, stabbing, or murder, and, and he became a one-issue candidate. And that one issue got him 47% of the vote in the state, which is a lot. I mean, no governor's race has been that close in New York in almost 30 years, and no Republican has done that well in 20 um, since George Pataki won a third term. So you, you, you start right there with a pretty disciplined campaign capitalizing on fear of crime and also, um, you know, a, a, a media driven narrative around crime. You also had a very ineffectual Democratic campaign from Kathy Hochul and, and, and really from, from the state party, which is functionally useless. You know, Hochul, someone who for large uh, parts of the summer was uh, was really utilizing a Rose Garden strategy, not doing all that much beyond running television ads, not in New York City all that much where the bulk of votes are. It really was only in like the final week or two when the alarm bell started to sound and they started to get elected officials like Zoran involved. Um, so you know, it, it was a campaign without a message really. Uh, there, there was no compelling reason offered to voters um, for Kathy Hochul. It was only you know, Lee Zeldin is bad and that's that. And so I think finally in the end, she was able to kind of scare up enough of a vote out of New York City uh, to go against Zeldin and therefore uh, for her. So you know, we, we have in New York a, a pr pretty much a useless Democratic Party organization. Uh, we have a governor who has only been in office a year, but, but so far has not really shown an ability to message very well around the accomplishments she does have, but also, I think, more importantly, to offer an affirmative vision for the future. And I remember I did a piece about her um, about a month ago, and I was trying to interview her and they refused, which I wasn't surprised about. But really what surprised me is I, I sent softball questions in 
to the spokesperson, you know, just trying to find out, you know, what, what do you want for next year out of all of you? What do you want to do in the next four years? And they could not answer. It was a very bland general answer that meant almost nothing. So I think you combine all of that, a strong Republican campaign, fear around crime, a weak Democratic campaign, um, a lot of super PAC spending from Republicans as well. I don't, I don't want to discount that. And you get a margin that was very close. And that close margin really hurt Democrats down the ballot in the House, especially. And you had the ent- the wipeout of the entire, um, you know, the, the entire Long Island House delegation went Republican, which has not happened in many decades. The Hudson Valley, every Republican was successful, um, except for the Republican who ran against uh, Pat Ryan, who, who managed to win again. Um, the Syracuse area, that, that seat looks to be um, held by a Republican again. So you, you just had on the House level um, this complete GOP dominance, which was not reflected in other parts of the country, which was really fascinating. So Zoran, as a progressive, I want to know what your perspective is on this, because many people have observed that if this were to have happened um, on a progressive's watch, if there were a, you know, um, uh, Cynthia Nixon style governor situation where the top of the ticket could be blamed for downstream negative effects, it would have th- that that blame would have um, happened. Moreover, my understanding is that, as Ross alluded to, Hochul's ability to succeed in the ninth inning was largely due to rallying from WFP and other progressives in the state and in New York City in particular. So what do you make of this? And especially this question of crime, which people are saying cuts both ways. One, against Democrats insofar as Republicans have made an issue of it. But other people are saying that Hochul basically leaning into the Republican messaging prevented people from seeing real distinctions there that actually could have enabled her to fare better uh, in this race. Absolutely. I mean, I think if, if you look back to the budget um, in in April of this year, one of the major battles was between Governor Hochul and the legislature, where Governor Hochul wanted to undo some of bail reform's largest pieces of that 2019 legislation. And in her attempts that were ultimately successful to undo portions of that, she was very much echoing Republican talking points. And even in a public op-ed about the issue, she stated, while the data shows that bail reform is successful, here are a number of things that we need to do. So when you start to lean into that you know, narrative, it then becomes very difficult when you're put up against a Republican who is the master of that kind of language. This is from their playbook. Because then if somebody cares about that worldview and that is their ultimate framework on who they vote for, they would obviously take the person who is the original, the origin of this kind of thinking, as opposed to, you know, a more watered down version of Republican talking points. So I do think that 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 is one of the key issues is that so much of this race was on the issue of crime and the question of crime and the question of law and order and and, and disorder. Um, I think another issue though, is that, you know, Typically, when you think about the New York landscape and you think about local politics, you think that the people who are most, the people considered marginals, the, the elected officials in the most kind of swing portions of the state are outside of New York City. But all of the losses that occurred in the New York State Assembly were inside New York City. And what I think that also speaks to is a state party apparatus and local county apparatuses that have not learned at all from the glaring messages of recent elections, which have shown the rightward shift of certain communities and certain districts across our five boroughs, versus Lee Zeldin learning very clearly from those results, even as recently as Curtis Sliwa running against Eric Adams in the general election for the New York City mayor's race, and focusing on Asian communities and in specific portions of East Queens and South Brooklyn, on Orthodox communities, and hammering home a message that is tailor-made for those communities, doing long-term engagement and outreach to those communities. And all of that stands in stark contrast with the governor's campaign, where I was calling the campaign to try and initiate sustained Muslim outreach for the campaign, right? Saying that this is a clearly Islamophobic candidate running on the Republican line 
There are other Republicans who have said incendiary things about Muslims. We have a clear opportunity here to talk to New Yorkers and make it clear what the choice is. But in effect, I was trying to orchestrate that at the last minute because it wasn't a pre-existing aspect of that campaign. Yeah, this is the first. I mean, honestly, I got to say, I hadn't heard much about Zeldin before this. And it, this is literally the first time I'm hearing that he was explicitly Islamophobic or even tacitly Islamophobic. And it does seem like a real problem for there not to have been any kind of counter messaging and to squarely fight this battle on crime. But I, I do want to also ask you, so on, I, I have heard, I think I, I was listening to an interview um, AOC gave uh, to Ryan Grimm at The Intercept, where she was also pointing the finger at the, I think she described it as anemic, the infrastructure of the of the state party that has basically become anemic as a consequence of having democratic control for such a long time. And that it just simply doesn't have the wherewithal. Is not used to basically having to defend this kind of ground. I mean, how much do you attribute to those kind of structural problems? And in the wake of this electoral outcome, is there any energy to address uh, being put toward addressing it? Yeah, I think that there's a lot to attribute. Uh, a, a lot of these failures that have occurred in the most recent election should be chalked up to the absolute absence of a state party apparatus, right? We have a state party who is far more interested than de in defeating the left than in combating the extreme right. And we have seen that explicitly in their financial disclosures, right? The chair of the New York State Democratic Party is a man named Jay Jacobs, who has personally maxed out financial contributions to candidates who are running against socialists in Democratic Party primaries. But when it comes to extremely consequential ballot referendums, like the one that took place last November, which would have help to put in place a congressional map that would have been far more favorable to Democrats, Jay Jacobs' Democratic Party did not spend a single dollar. And I think that that just showcases, one, how unserious this man is about running this party, and two, it calls into question a number of people within our party who do not have a view of power as a means to actually do something with it, but rather simply a thing to hold and a thing to simply be in proximity to. But for so many of us, and this spans across an ideological divide, we have a clear belief that if you are in positions of power, then you must use that power to actually achieve the vision that you were supposedly elected or appointed to do so. Yeah, I mean, in that interview, ASC alluded to um, uh, India Walton's race, the lack of support that she got running for mayor of Buffalo winning and still being defeated by a right wing, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> right wing, LOL sort of a writing campaign by the uh, incumbent. Ross, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say both are true. Yeah, yeah. Well, Cuomo may be gone, but his entire infrastructure, much of his infrastructure and much of the political machinery uh, that he put in place is still there. And this is a machinery that is disorganized. It is sycophantic. Uh, it is relies on lobbyists and big money, and it really undercuts the ability for there to be a farming grassroots and state level organizing across the state. And so when that languishes and there's very little organizing, organizing happening, yeah, I mean, basically you're leaving a void for Republicans to walk into. And so I actually think a lot of these Republican gains aren't necessarily like as strong as they may seem. I think it's really from an absence. It's a testament to the corruption that has allowed to continue uh, in the New York State Democratic Party. And, and I mean, we saw that with India Walton. We mm -hmm. saw it like loud and clear. Rosa, would you bring you back in here? Because we talked about the implications of the redistricting last time you were on Bad Faith. And I wonder what you make of the outcome here where the DCCC chair has been ousted from a seat that he kind of wrested from um, uh, home, hometown boy Mondaire Jones, who was then forced to go and participate in a crowded race. Um, what was it in New York's 10th district? Yes, the 10th. Yes. What do you so, make of this outcome? Yeah. So on one hand, this was from you know from the summer on where it looked like the, this new redrawn district that Maloney had or that he sought out was going to be very competitive. Uh, you know, from, from what I've seen, Maloney himself 
while he spent a lot of money and siphoned a lot of resources off to off for his race for his reelection, he also was out of the country for, for parts of the race. Was fundraising overseas, which is amazing. <laughs> Where was he? And, um, he was. He went on a junket. I, I saw to Europe uh, to try to raise money for the DCCC, and I, I guess for himself. Um, cool, cool, and, cool. And you know, I mean, you know, Sean Patrick Maloney is, is kind of the platonic ideal of the left's idea of a terrible moderate. You know, he's someone who has spent much of his career yelling at the left, trying to kneecap the left. You know, I still think of him as the guy who ran a fake campaign for attorney general uh, four years ago at the behest of Andrew Cuomo to stop Zephyr Teachout from becoming AG of New York. And so in a way, this is the divine justice that Sean Patrick Maloney gets. Uh, but, you know, more importantly, I think something that Zaron said is true is that a lot of these people, whether it's Jay Jacobs or Sean Patrick Maloney, they, they don't take organizing seriously and they don't really have an idea of what they want to do with power. I think Lee Zeldin, the, the right-wing Republican, has an idea of what he wants to do with power. And to an extent, the Republicans in the past few years have taken organizing more seriously in New York City and in communities of color, which is the type of thing that, um, you know, no Democrat would ever want, want to say or, or, or defend in any way or, you know, or, or to endorse. But, you know, you look at the outreach in the Asian community, especially in the Latino community, you know, I mean, Zeldin was campaigning there for a long time. Um, Republicans don't have much of an organizing infrastructure statewide, but Democrats don't either. And, it's, it's something you mentioned the AOC interview where she said that Democrats have grown soft maybe because New York is a democratic state, but it really, it, it goes beyond that. I mean, this lack of a democratic party organization is a decades long issue. It was an issue for the entirety of Cuomo's tenure is an issue before then. It was an issue when Republicans controlled the state Senate, which they did until 2019. Other states have party organizations that do basic stuff. You go to New Hampshire, you go to Nevada, you go to Michigan, you, you can go to a lot of states. K Kansas, I'm sure, which just reelected a Democratic governor. They have parties that call uh, voters, organize volunteers, pay for smart mail and digital campaigns, have clubs or local county level organizations who they coordinate with. The parties can recruit candidates. They can help fund candidates. They're all imperfect in their own ways, but they're all doing things that just are not done in New York at all. If you, you want to run for office in New York, you're on, you're on your own. Even if you're someone who's, quote, institutionally aligned, it's up to you. No one's recruiting you. You're raising your own money. You know, you're trying to seek ties with labor and other interest groups. And even if you're in a general election, you know, I talked to candidates who lost on Long Island, you know, Jay Jacobs. In addition to chairing the state party, he's the chair of the Nassau County Democratic Party as well. And in Nassau County, the Democrats were wiped away completely. And I spoke with House candidates running out there and their people, and they said Jay Jacobs was nowhere to be found. You know, I mean, he is someone who I think at this point unites all the ideological factions of the state in that there is agreement that he must go. I think that's the easy part. I do think he, he won't remain. I think the harder part is... Hochul and the Democrats figuring out how do we actually build a functioning state party in New York that does these things that other states to that other states do, but also ensures that Republicans don't continue to make inroads with working class non-white communities. And we've seen this for multiple cycles. It's been true across America, but New York City especially, it is striking how neighbor Chinese majority neighborhoods that for decades voted Democrat without question are now Republican strongholds. And that happened in just a few years. And that is something if I were a Democrat in power, I'd be very alarmed about. I mean, look, we, we've made reference to, you know, the sweep in Staten Island, the rightward shift in Hudson Valley. But, you know, th this map, I see that Andrew Kaczynski tweeted it out, um, you know, Every single county moved further right in New York this year. If it comes down, he says, if it comes down to just a few seats in New York, Democrats, um, uh, sorry, sorry, if it comes down to just a few seats, New York Democrats and backlash to Democratic policy slash rule in New York will have cost them the House. I, I saw reporting that Chuck Schumer's margins were dramatically smaller even than they have been in years. Um, 
this is this is a, a significant problem. So I, I would love to hear you guys weigh in more, um, perhaps coming back to you, Zoran, about what kind of messaging is being effective in communities like the Chinese American community, in Orthodox or Muslim communities, in these brown communities in New York City, because this is not the typical picture that we get where we're looking to see if rural areas swing one way or the other in, a, in an election. This is blue strongholds. Yeah, this is happening. Yeah. I think that there are a number of things. One is I think it's critically important for any campaign to be nimble and to have targeted messaging that goes beyond one generic overall message. Right. When I ran for office, I created a list of Muslim voters in my district, and we made sure to reach out to these voters specifically around concerns that were disproportionately impacting the Muslim community. And the rationale being, if the NSA has these lists, we should probably make these lists as well and get people <laughs> to the polls. And <laughs> when I was telling, when I was talking to the the governor's campaign, I was saying that you know. You have one week, two weeks left. I know you cannot stand up a canvassing operation in that time period, but we can do digital ads. We can simply take quotes that Lee Zeldin has said about Muslims, about Ilhan Omar, when he was holding hearings on the radicalization of our community, these kinds of things, and share it with people to make it clear what the contrast is. But that interest, that apparatus, it is, it's non-existent. The party, as Ross has said, is, is very much calcified. And the issue is that this is something that oftentimes creates right conditions for the left, right? In that the party is not as strong as it may appear in these kind of um, in these primaries. But then when it comes to fending off the extreme right, there's no interest in immobilizing even for that. And I think that you know one thing that struck me is in my district, I ran ahead of the governor mm. because of the votes that I received. Mm -hmm. I did not have a challenger. The only message that I had was an affirmative message. There was no beware of the, you know, the extremist Republican on the other side of the ballot, vote for me to stop them. It was just, this is my vision for our neighborhood. This is my vision for New York. And that got more votes than our governor did. And I think a lot of that has to do with an affirmative vision is also one that competes with these Republican talking points mm -hmm. to address the relevance to working people's lives. So yeah, yeah, please. I, yeah. I was, when I was standing at the at the corner outside of the poll site, more than a hundred feet, for anyone keeping keeping caps, <laughs> uh, uh, I was giving out stickers for universal rent control. I was talking to people about the Con Ed rate case. I was trying to address: here is what we know is happening in your life with your rent skyrocketing, with your energy company trying to put an additional sixty bucks a month onto your bill. And this is the actions that we are taking versus trying to compete on a Republican landscape of talking points and issues. And that affirmative message, it's missing. And instead, what we found is you have the Republican saying things are bad. And then the Democratic Party ends up saying things are fine. And the truth is things are pretty tough right now. But our assessment of why and what we're going to do about it is completely different from the Republicans, and that's what we have to lean into. I, I yeah. was yeah, go ahead. Sorry, oh, go sorry ahead. no, I, I was struck by how worse the Hochul messaging was than even baseline Senate and gubernatorial Democratic candidates in other states. So I, I wrote a piece for New York Magazine on the New Hampshire Senate race between Maggie Hassan and, and Don Bolduc, who like Lee Zeldin was kind of of this Trump far right. An interesting thing with Hassan was from what I saw when I saw her speak, she was speaking about accomplishments that came out of the Democratic Congress. She had this very, I would say, uh, no frill stump speech that mentioned the things they've been doing to attempt to combat inflation, um, invest in rural schools, um, get lower uh, prescription drug costs through the change in, in, in Medicare, the ability of Medicare to negotiate these costs and onward and onward, right? The Biden Congress had done things that had actual accomplishments in two years, the infrastructure spending as well. And you saw candidates talk about them and, and it worked to an extent. And you see it with other, you know, whether it's Whitmer in Michigan or Evers in, in Wisconsin, these candidates would actually talk about things they had done and then offer promises for the future, right? It's, it's this novel idea. 
And it was remarkable that with Hochul, it was just absent. You'd go to the website, you're like, what, what has she done? And I know as a journalist that she had accomplishments this year, huge amounts of inve invest, huge investments in public schools, for example. You know, Cuomo had shorted public education for many years. The first Hochul budget, at least I thought, was pretty generous to to um, K to 12 schools. And I, I think even higher ed to an extent, right? Nothing about that. Uh, and and it, it was just amazing how little this campaign could talk about what they had done and what they wanted to do. And it wasn't as if other Democrats elsewhere struggled with that because they did it. And that that was, it was very notable to me. And I, I still don't quite understand why the, the campaign is so lackluster in that regard. Well, how much does, do you think, do you think it has to do with the fact that Hochul was this kind of, um, you know, Cuomo replacement, kind of a, a stopgap? Yeah, I don't mean to, and I'm trying to find the words that I'm not trying to be well, yeah, no, so she's dismissive, an, but. An accidental governor. You yeah. Know, she's the lieutenant who never expected to serve. <laughs> right. There, there goes Andrew Cuomo, right? Um, how much does that have to do with that? I'm sure something, right? I mean, she's someone who she's elected to a term in Congress. She was Erie County clerk. She's from the Buffalo area. She's not well known downstate. She's not a bad politician by any means. And I, I think she does generally mean well. And, I, and she could be end up a very good governor. You know, she's just getting started one year in office. She's got a full term with a Democratic legislature. A lot can happen, right? But yeah, you know, she's someone who this was her first serious statewide race with a lot of scrutiny. She had run for lieutenant governor before and actually gotten two primaries from the left and, and, and fended them off. And if these primaries are better funded, they probably would have won. But yeah, you know, she, she was not experienced doing this and it showed. But, but, it, but beyond that, it, I don't think you need a great amount of experience just to go out there and say, in the 2022 budget, here's what we did. Here's what we were doing to address the needs of working class New Yorkers. Here's what we want to do next year. You know, it doesn't take political genius to do this. This is something, again, the replacement level House and Senate candidates and other states were doing. But I do think it, you know, it's, it speaks to that lack of organization, the lack of urgency, just Across the state, particularly downstate in New York City and on Long Island, these Democratic Party organizations are so atrophied. And, you know, th that's half the story of AOC's rise, which has been, been talked about ad nauseum. She ran a great campaign. Joe Crowley was living in Virginia and the Queens Democratic Party had stopped knocking on doors and talking to voters in like 1985. You know, I mean, that, that was half the tale of AOC's rise. So, Again, as Oran said, it's one thing, you know, progressives can take advantage of that, and that's exciting. But then in the general elections, that lack of organization can really come back to bite you when very, you know, very conservative Republicans win these races and make inroads. And that's what you really saw uh, in New York. Well, I mean, she also, I, I, uh, there was some criticism of the choice to pluck uh, Antonio Delgado out of his purple district. Uh where he was the incumbent uh, to serve as lieutenant governor, leaving that as an open seat that people had to scrap for, which fell uh, to Republicans. I mean, these are the kinds of strategic choices that, I mean, I don't know, sometimes we maybe give too much credit to Republicans and you know, we think of them as like so much more vastly organized and um, calculated as compared to Democrats. But that does seem like the kind of mulligan that is just I, I, inexcusable. Yeah. I, I was shocked she did that at the time. I, and I was surprised more people weren't alarmed by that. I'm like, wait, so you're taking out a congressman who twice held down a crucial swing race, who's now going to have to run against a, a pretty accomplished Republican in, in Mark Molinaro, who won his race. He's a Dutchess County executive. You're taking him out of the seat to make him lieutenant governor. I, I, in multiple ways, it made no sense. One, Delgado had no name recognition in New York City, where the bulk of votes are. If you want to win in New York, you really have to do well in New York City. Delgado had literally no ties to New York City. Um, I think they made this very bizarre identity politics calculation. Oh, it's a black man with a Hispanic name. And that'll be great for us. And it's like, well, no, I mean, that's not how voters work. But, but yeah, I mean, more importantly, it, it really was a, a cell phone, right? I mean, they lo Democrats lost this seat. <laughs> I mean, it just flipped. So imagine if you had Antonio Delgado running against Molinaro, Delgado might have won. And instead, he's lieutenant governor. Great for him. He collects his salary. He doesn't have to go to D.C. Not great for the rest of the country. 
Yeah, and I, I don't know much about him, but I remember um, his initial race, and I, th I found him to be a very compelling, very charismatic um, candidate that potentially had a huge future ahead of him. And it is deeply frustrating to see these kind of choices made with folks' political careers. The same with Mondaire Jones, who does anyone have a sense about of what's going to happen to him? <laughs> I mean, I saw he, he made this kind of snarky tweet, you know, um, when Sean Patrick Maloney lost. Like an uh, oh really style <laughs> tweet. <laughs> what what's gonna happen? <laughs> Zoran has insight into Mondaire. I I mean I I think Mondaire is not a fan of me because I, I wrote over the summer you know, many times that it was a not a great idea to to run in this Brooklyn seat and he should be making making his name known in a more aggressive way. You know in in Cobble Hill and all these nice neighborhoods. But, you know, it wasn't Mondaire's fault. You know, Sean Patrick Maloney bullied him out. There's no doubt about that. And he, he's a very talented politician who I still think has a bright future. I think for him, you know, he's got choices to make, right? I mean, he could move back to, to Westchester or Rockland County. You know, all would be forgiven. The people in, in that district, I'm sure, would be happy to see him run against Mike Waller in 2024. So, you know, if I were Mondaire, I would be uh, breaking the lease on my nice uh, Cobble Hill apartment <laughs> unless he really likes it. And this is a, it's a hot, still a hot real estate market. So it's a decent time to break your lease. You can find someone to take over your apartment. I would, I'd move back. You know, I, I think that would be the best shot uh, for, for him and his future, you know, pr primary Dan Goldman seems like a, a, a tougher, a, a, you know, a lot tougher in this something that would be, you know, probably he would get a lot of you know backlash from like party regular types but you know that that I mean, would he, you don't you don't think on some level people feel like he's owed like the democratic yeah. party made a calculation followed sean patrick maloney into the abyss and lost at sure. this point do you think that he's gonna get any uh, payback oh i i meant i guess i meant when i say party regulars i meant the, the dc i meant washington dc really mm -hmm. like, like the, the pelosi Democrats who just will defend incumbents at all costs. And Dan Goldman is very wealthy and he'll, he'll be a prolific fundraiser. So I'm guessing like the, the, the Pelosi and her allies will not help Mondaire at all. If he wanted to run against Dan Goldman, they would probably try to undercut him. Whereas if he went to run against Mike Lawler, he would have the total buy-in of the DC establishment and of progressives. So it's kind of, it's like one of those best of all world races where I think it's very winnable to get Biden plus 10 district. And you kind of would, would get the marriage of the establishment and the grassroots progressive one. So, so, so that's this just is, my this is speculation. What's so fascinating. And for, for a lot of people listening to this podcast, they're thinking they've, you know, screw, screw Democrats altogether, right? We've we've seen them screw people who we didn't think they were that progressive to, to begin with, like Mondaire Jones. We see them screw over people who were quite progressive, like uh, India Walton. We've seen that we've seen um, kind of the lack of support, even for people like AOC, with a famous moment of Nancy Pelosi causing her to cry over the um, Iron Dome vote. And to, so, to a lot of people who listen to this podcast, they think, why do progressives continue to beat their head against the wall, seeing how feckless the party is, how disorganized the party is, and how, as AOC said in this, I think, really interesting interview that she just gave to Ryan Grimm, how often you rise up through the ranks in the Democratic Party by beating up, by demonstrating your willingness to beat up on progressives, even to the extent that it causes the Democratic Party to lose seats. It seems that they've made their choice. They'd rather lose then validate um, progressives who are really going to fundamentally uh, challenge the, t the party's donor base, et cetera. So Zoran, I, I wonder what you make of it. I, I heard, um, you know, Working Families Party uh, representatives talk about how they were the ones that pulled it out for Hochul in the final stretch, how they were the ones that filled the gap. And you seem to be reflecting this as well. What do you see as the future for progressives, even in a state as blue ostensibly as New York is, if, the, it's, if there's this much headwind? Well, I think... First, I think that what WFP has been saying is absolutely true. I received one piece of mail in the entirety of the general election, and it was from the Working Families Party telling me to go out and vote for Hochul on their line. And I vote in every single election, right? and, and yet there was no concerted outreach in that manner from the official Hochul campaign. And I think that that speaks to a larger sense of taking certain constituencies for granted. I think, you know, to... To the, to, the, to the question of why should we be engaging in the struggle and what should we be doing given the history of how people have risen in the party, 
I think that first of all, you're absolutely right that so many people's um, leadership positions have been based on a record of beating up on progressives, but it doesn't have to be that way. And when you look at this moment, it is a rare moment in time where there is a growing acknowledgement outside of just the left of how useless Democratic Party leadership has been, specifically Jake Jacobs, and how vast the consequence has been of their absolutely useless leadership. And so there's this growing opening and constituency and sense of a demand about a different direction of a party that actually offers a set of ideas and plans and ambitions to the crises that working class people are facing in the state. And so in that moment, I think that we have a chance to depart from our recent history in having someone else be at the head of this party, having someone who understands that the threat of the left and the threat of the right are not the same thing, that really what we need to do in this one moment is ensure that we do not get individuals such as Lee Zeldin in any executive position and leave primary debates and disputes and, and races to Democratic Party voters, as opposed to trying to put a thumb on a scale in one sense and then standing back and hoping that we don't have a fascist enter into the second floor. But, but Zeron, here, here's the problem. We just, I mean, we opened this conversation talking about Hochul's deficiencies. Frankly, the only thing I remember her really coming into the news cycle about was her choice to uh, kind of make the, the, su- the subway maps that say you can wear your mask any way you want, seemingly trying to capitalize on what felt at the time to be a significant cultural shift toward anti-masking, anti-mask mandates um, and that kind of, um, I I don't want to say even right word because frankly, it's all over the place. People who felt like the mandates and and such were too restrictive and not sufficiently um, tied to kind of sincerely held public health interests. So I saw her kind of signaling to that crowd with the the masking signage. And as we discussed, there was all of the signaling around crime. So now we're being now we're we're having a conversation about whether or not it's worth it to fight tooth and nail to get Hochul in office because at least when she's there, progressives have a chance to pass through a progressive agenda. And I understand that. I understand that Lee Zeldin is a Trump Republican who would have genuinely stymied a lot of things that could substantively get done. But the idea that Hochul isn't similarly an impediment to a progressive agenda, I I only hesitate because it isn't just a progressive agenda. It's a mainstream agenda in so many respects, I think makes people, I think, understandably have very mixed feelings about what the end goals are here and how whether or not this is a good place for them to sink their effort. I mean, is a progressive going to run a challenger to the governor's office? Are we going to see another effort like a Cynthia Nixon? And if we do, are we also just going to see that person get dogpiled by the Democratic Party in the same way that Cynthia Nixon got dogpiled by Democrats in New York State? I mean, look, I think that I am not asking anyone to sit back and trust that things will be different now. What I'm saying is that there is an opening to create a different path. And there is no question that when a primary, if and when a primary comes in the future for the governor's position or any high ranking state Democratic Party position, that the party and the center will be absolutely ready to dogpile on any left challenge. But I do think that we have this moment where we can talk to Democrats of all persuasions and say that that style of politics, that has delivered us a Republican house. And what matters more to you? Do you, would you rather defeat progressives at home or defeat the far right across the country? And a lot of people outside of the left have an understanding that what is more consequential and what is more important is keeping candidates like Lee Zeldin far, far away from office. And so I think that there it opens up a possibility. Now, I'm not saying that you know the number one agenda that we must have in this moment is everybody join the state party committee and then when the next vote comes up that we agitate and organize at that level. For those of whom that is their major passion, that is fantastic, they should do that. Now what my focus and my work turns towards is enacting the affirmative agenda that we have. Because as you said it, with Lee Zeldin, there is not even a chance in hell that we get to pass even a modicum of what it is that we're fighting for. 
with Kathy Hochul, the debate begins. I have no illusions about where the governor is on so much of what we want to fight for. Oftentimes she is in many ways, the final boss that you have to get to at the end of the video game. But I know that there's actually a path. I can give you one example. The MTA is, the MTA is at a fiscal cliff in this upcoming budget cycle. With Lee Zeldin as the governor, we would have had entire subway lines eliminated, all in the name of cuts and prudent f- fiscal austerity. With Kathy Which, Hochul, Wait a minute, which subway lines were they going to try to get rid of? The, the MTA is, is forecast to be more than $2 billion in debt. And Lee Zeldin spoke about, like Ross was saying, he never went that deep into specifics outside of crime. But with the MTA and with many, many different issues of public funding, he spoke about wanting to cut back spending by the billions. And the MTA has spoken about if they didn't get the money, whether it be from the feds initially or now from the state, then they would have to cut back service. And so for me, when I think about it through the lens of our trains, I get to think of here is one way where we can keep what we have. And then now we have an opening to actually create a world-class transit system that befits a city such as ours. So these are the kinds of kind of clear-eyed decisions we have to make, but then we can't rest on our laurels and just trust that mainstream Democrats will deliver us to that future. We have to fight, build power, and do mass movement organizing. And if that is of your interest, then I would encourage all of you to join me in DSA. And I think Zoran, one thing on on the MTA with Zoran is right too. You know, Hochul actually proposed a very ambitious project that she didn't mention all in the campaign. It was something called the Interborough Express, which would run passenger rail on freight lines in Brooklyn and Queens and create this long proposed and never realized uh, commuter rail line uh, that would really be able to move people around the city in a way the subways cannot since the subway system basically was designed to get people to Manhattan and out of Manhattan. So it was a great idea. There's no way Zeldin would do it. But I I, I think what Zoran is saying true in the sense that, you know, Hochul could be an impediment to the left. But Hochul is someone you can work with and work against. She's someone you can pressure. I mean, don't forget, you know, Cuomo was the greatest enemy of the left. And, and in 2019, the state legislature got historic tenant protections through um, through the legis- through legislature and, you know, got it to Cuomo's desk and he, and he signed it. So, yes, there are Democrats that are enemies of the left and then Hochul would probably fall into that bucket. But given who she is, she's someone who with the right amount of pressure and organizing and movement building can be pushed to sign off on pretty far reaching stuff. And I think that's the goal of progressives, of socialists. That's why DSA keeps sending more members to Albany, you know, which each cycle more join them. And it's, as Oran will talk about, it's still a very small block. There's still many, many obstacles, but it's a project that is bearing fruit and you are building towards something. And I, I think in this cycle, most voters is on the left realize that there, there wasn't enough of a contrast between Hochul and Zeldin, that if you got Zeldin, for example, all kinds of uh, hopes for strengthening tenant protections would be dead on arrival. With Hochul, she, she's in the pocket of the real estate industry. But like with Cuomo, if the public outcry is there and the pressure builds aggressively enough, you can get things done. It's just if you had Zeldin as governor, all kinds of bills and ambitions would be dead because he can veto them and the legislature would struggle to override the veto. And that's the reality of it. They don't like to override vetoes. So there is a difference. And there is, I think the good news for the left in New York is there's a project that is absolutely being built and there are ambitions being realized. It's just, it's, it's got a long way to go and there's a lot more to do. The failure of Hochul to adopt a messaging strategy that would have made this race much less of a nail biter, despite the legitimate gains that progressives have made in New York and the bigger voice that progressives have now than probably at any time, at least since, you know, the golden age of the 1920s or whatever in terms of progressive politics. You know, that gives me pause. It causes me some concern. Ross, I listened to you recently um, engage in a debate uh, with Ben Burgess and others about policing. This has been a conversation that has been divisive even among the left, where a certain faction that includes some of the hosts over at TYT think that the left has been 
too soft on crime or its messaging has allowed it to be characterized as too soft on crime and has taken an approach that at times sounds to some ears as pretty conservative in the way that it addresses the homelessness crisis, for instance, um, and which seems to prioritize people's distaste for seeing homeless people over um, substantive reforms that can address underlying causes. I do think that there are progressive progressives, I don't know if it's progressive policy, but progressives in places like California who have made terrible decisions. And so one of those terrible decisions is essentially doing away with anti camping laws, right? Allowing people to camp out wherever they want, whenever they want. And if like we have a homeless problem in California, we have it all throughout the country, but it's particularly bad in California. And so the argument is, well, if there isn't public housing available for people, they should be allowed to camp out. Okay, but there's also a problem right now where there is public housing available and individuals will say, no, I don't want to take it. I don't want to follow the rules in the public housing. And so as a result, I would rather camp out. Progressive lawmakers are like, we should allow them to camp out. And you know what happens? Crime happens. Open air drug markets happen, and it's the truth. These are the facts of the matter. In fact, it was addressed in this Daily Beast article, and honestly, it was cathartic to read it because everyone denies that this is happening. I think the concern is, is there a risk that wanting to, well, how how strong is the left movements? What, what does it say about the balance of power if it seems like parts of the left is actually bending to the right? as opposed to the other way around. And is there gonna be any, are there gonna be any consequences? Is there really gonna be a reckoning about whether or not the right slanted messaging of someone like Hochul and so many moderate Democrats um, didn't actually work? Perhaps damn them more than just leaning left or provi providing a left response to people's genuine concerns about crime. Like, I guess I'm not necessarily convinced that the left is having the influence on the center as opposed to the other way around when I look at the level of discourse that's happening, even in ostensibly the most left spaces of the internet. I mean, what, well, I mean, what do you make of that exchange, Rob? It's, well, no, it, it's a really, really fascinating topic, right? And I think there's a few different components to it. First, there is the reformist prosecutor movement and, and the movement around bail reform, which in many ways did unite the left and the center and continues to be successful in electing progressive, you know, oriented reform oriented prosecutors, you know, Larry Krasner won his reelection in Philadelphia, Boutin got recalled in San Francisco. Um, in LA though, Gasco and, and Krasner, I will say, recalled. you know, Dr. Oz, bless his soul, <laughs> tried to make a big deal of Krasner and Republicans in the state tried to, you know, bring down you know, Democratic candidates by association. And you did see some folks trying to back off of that a little bit. Yeah. So, so I, I think it's a few different things. I, on, in certain instances, it's definitely about not bowing to the fear mongering and holding firm in policy. You know, bail reform is a great example of this. You know, in 2019, New York partially, not completely ended cash bail. And you've had this multi-year effort on the part of Republicans and centrist Democrats to undercut the reforms, to blame bail reform on every single type of crime. And to me, that's always been silly because you have elevated rates of crime across America in many different cities. And all these states did not suddenly change their bail laws. It was just New York, right? So I, I think the, the legislature and people, you know, people like Zoran certainly agree with this, but also other Democrats who support criminal justice reform, they should stick to their proverbial guns and, and, and not give in on this and not continue to weaken these reforms to appease some part of the electorate or, you know, these conservative forces that will never be appeased. You know, like Zoran said, Hochul weakened bail reform this year in Albany, didn't matter at all. Zeldin still outflanked her and attacked her on crime every single day, right? So on that, on that part of it and on reformist style prosecuting, I think the left should give no ground at all. The, the discussion I was having with Ben Burgess is on defunding the police, where I, I fundamentally agree with a lot of the aims of defunding the police. I think demilitarizing the police is very important. There's certainly a lot of base there. You know, uh, you, you have this, you know, 
the, this standing army in New York City that has really, you know, caused a lot of pain in a lot of different communities. To me, though, it's inarguable that the, the messaging around defund the police was very bad. And I think the left has to be cognizant of how they talk about issues, especially in working class communities, where for a lot of people in higher crime areas, you know, especially if you go in, in Brooklyn or Queens to where the a bulk of shootings take place, they do want police there. The defund the police argument holds less water where you have a mother, you know, whose son was just shot by a gang member and, you know, they, and they have no one to call or they feel like they aren't being heard or they feel like their crime isn't being solved. You know, something I really do believe, and I think the left has lost its way, some parts of the left on defund is this idea that people don't care about their, their crimes getting solved. And you hear, you know, critics of police go, well, they stink at their jobs, therefore defund them. Well, well, no, I mean, in other facets of society, if, you know, education or, you know, transit is failing, you don't say, well, pull their, pull all their funding streams and they'll magically improve. You know, for me, I want better police. I think it's very important to solve crimes, to bring justice for people, especially in communities of color where they've had a long and fraught relationship with the police, right? And, and I think you really need to bring the focus onto social services and onto helping people and less around this, what I truly believe is libertarian messaging, which is saying defund, cut, defund, cut. You know, the, the left for a long time was put on the defensive by the right who would say, well, the only way to reform education is to cut its budget in half. And these teachers make too much money. These principals make too much money. And then, you know, you saw in 2020, that kind of rhetoric get reappropriated, reappropriated in a very different way. So it's a very tricky thing. But I, I do think, when, when you go, for example, Zoran mentioned like the Asian community. If you're going into like the Chinese community in Brooklyn, you are going to get demolished if you say, I wanted to fund the police. You will lose. These are people who have been targeted of hate crimes. They're very scared right now. It's just not the way you talk about public safety. So I think on one hand, the left should not give ground on policy like bail reform, like discovery reform, like all these ways uh, that, that, that it is trying to fix the criminal justice system. I do think on messaging, though, you have to be very cognizant because there was a backlash against the fund. It was very real. And you're seeing it particularly in the Asian community. And you're starting to see it in the Latino community uh, in, across the country, New York City, especially. And I do think some of that revolves around the fund. I do so, Zoran, I, I won't say much because my audience knows how I feel about this, except for to say that I think that that's largely a straw man because nobody's actually running on defund the police. So people who are messaging actually very beautifully, speaking very specifically about the fact that there's no relationship between increasing police funding and people solving crimes are being tagged as somehow arguing for defund. And there is this pivot that I think is being enabled by many people on the left to actually making a conversation about something that nobody is actually bringing to communities anywhere and saying, actually, don't talk about these substantive reforms that do pull well because that's somehow defund and defund the separate other language that everyone says everyone's using that's so bad and that communities are bulking at isn't actually being used by any organizers or being presented to any groups. Well, they did, though. That's the issue. They aren't anymore, but they did two years ago, and they're still paying a price. The question is, how long will you pay a price for that? You who, may not who, much longer. Who, who the, is, working, who, the Working Families Party was tweeting to fund the police, Planned Parenthood. Like, all these mainstream organizations got swept up in the summer of 2020. Right, and, 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 and these tweets, the tweets live on, and, and, and the messaging lives on. I'm not yeah. saying that it's fair in 2022 you have to deal with that. What I'm saying is there's an entire year where that messaging was prominent well, that, but that's not messaging. organizations. I, I think if, I've said this before. I really don't want to get into this again, but I think if the left spent one 16th of the time it spent explaining why defund is a bad slogan, actually defund, explaining what defund means, which is not, of course, snapping your fingers tomorrow and, and eliminating police departments and their ability to actually solve and resolve crimes. It's about interrogating whether or not the funding is actually going toward that effort as opposed to, um, creating a, a, a facilitating mass incarceration, et cetera. But I mean, Zoran, you're someone who is having to make these arguments and bring it to communities. So I want you to weigh in on whether you think the kind of brouhaha around defund stands when you look at the messaging approach taken by people like Hochul, who leaned so far in the other direction and also seemed to have been hurt by it. 
And I also just, I want to nail down a little bit more specifically before we wrap. You you said that Democrats like Hochul didn't bring a specific message to various ethnic communities, but it doesn't seem like Republicans did either yet were able to make certain kind of headways here. So, I mean, to what do you attribute Republican successes as well as the Democratic Party's failures? So first, I, I would contest a little bit of the premise of the second question in that I do think that the Republican Party did create targeting messaging for specific mm. communities, namely, you know, East Asian communities and Orthodox communities, uh, and and did sustained engagement meetings, the kind of the classic photo ops that uncles love, where the candidate is there and they're just meeting everyone and sitting mm. around the table and hearing the issues. And as much as we can joke about, you know, how repetitive so many of those events are, they are at their essence a chance for people to be heard, a chance for people to be seen. And you know, there was somebody who who stated in an article recently that if you were going by WeChat, you wouldn't even know that Governor Hochul was running for re-election. Hmm. And I think that just spoke to the asymmetry and effort and engagement around certain communities. And I think that the reason you're right in that the Zeldin campaign did not have a sustained effort towards Muslim communities, for example, or Indian communities, for example, obviously those things can overlap. But I think the reason that you don't see the Democratic side creeping up is because if people aren't engaged, they just stay home. And so my assessment is that a lot of communities that didn't receive the sustained kind of outreach are people who just didn't show up to the polls because the argument was never made to them as to the stakes of them voting. Do we have information about that? Do we do we know yet? I mean, obviously, youth turnout, for example, has been a story um, in much of the country that has been attributed to the red wave not materializing. Do we know about relative turnout ma- rates for various communities and what happened there? We don't have, the, we don't have but, the exact yeah. statistics around Muslims in New York State, for example, but I can tell you that before I ran in my district, Muslims were voting at a rate of around 7.5% turnout, mm-hmm. just 7.5%. And then when I ran, we increased that. But it just speaks to the fact that it is abysmal when it's left at the way the engagement has been historically. And mm. you have, you literally had a Republican candidate in on, on Long Island who was saying that he doesn't know a single person who has good things to say about Muslims. And the mm. only things that Muslims want to do is kill Hindus. These are literal words that came out of a candidate's mouth. And great, you know, good on the governor that she she went after that statement and she she critiqued that statement. But these are the kinds of things you can send to voters, let people know about. Now, the, the other thing is. Um, I do want to just also talk about the asymmetry that's taking place here, where you have Republicans who are messaging hard around, you know, bail reform and crime, and there isn't an attempt to message an alternative there. It's just yeah. accepting of the premise and then giving you a watered down version of it. So there isn't even a contest taking place. So for yeah. someone who cares about, you know, whether they feel safe or are safe, and as we know, those are two separate things in terms of the perception and the statistics. Mm-hmm. We're not presenting a debate. We're not presenting them with two options. And I think that that is also to the real detriment of contests that are taking place where the right will always win if all that is being presented is their argument and whether you agree or disagree with it. And I think that you could message so many left priorities in a way that speaks to public safety. You could message the MTA funding around public safety because so much of crime narrative is around subways. And so much of people feeling unsafe on subways is because we've lost about 35 to 40% of our ridership since COVID and you feel more isolated on the train. And so public disorder is amplified. And so you could even frame a campaign to fund the MTA and get ridership back to hundred as a campaign for public safety. Mm. If we talk about you know safe injection sites, you could frame that as People are using these needles on the street, unsafe for them, gives you a feeling of not being safe in your neighborhood, perhaps. You can rectify both of those things by having a safe injection site, taking it out of public view and making sure it is fully safe, right? These are all of the opportunities that exist, but there is an unwillingness to engage with any of these kinds of priorities and a desire to just compete on Republican turf. The last thing, you know, we've talked a lot about Hochul, Jay Jacobs. We haven't talked about Eric Adams. Mm. And that is somebody who 
helped to give rise to this panic around crime and bail reform. Yes, bail reform, the, the, the fight against it predated Adams, but he has been going after the reforms that we made in Albany every single day. He helped give rise to this belief that there was no sense of justice in the criminal justice system for victims because people were being let out every single moment, even though the data shows that to be completely incorrect. And where he did these things, it gives rise to this feeling that then actually electing Lee Zeldin would be a great partner for Eric Adams. Mm. Right? Where even Lee Zeldin is saying, I have a great relationship with Eric Adams. Mm -hmm. We've probably seen that you might even think. And so people in their minds are like, oh, this is a guy who's serious about crime and safety. This guy's going to be a great partner. Those two things make sense. The last thing I wanted to also mention is the New York Post. There is an asymmetry there as well, where you have an entire publication dedicated to stoking right-wing panic and fear in this city and in this state to the extent that they are trying to solicit individuals to give them stories where they have been victims of crime and promising them front page coverage if they will testify to these kinds of things. We don't have that on the left. We don't even have that on the center. And so those things all help to create a media environment and a political environment that is then exacerbated by the cowardice of the party and the ineffectiveness of it to lead us to this moment where we're limping over the finish line in a state where we should be the standard bearers of a left vision for this country. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point. And and to go back to what you know, the exchange that and Ross, the, sorry, the exchange that Ross and I were having. My concern isn't about whether or not someone wants to use a literal word defund in any kind of context. I defer to organizers about the language, the specific language that is useful in the communities that are engaging with. But there is this kind of presumption that defending any of the arguments that are in fact part of defund, whether you want to talk about it or not in that in those terms, um, is so toxic that people don't even engage on those merits. So when you're talking about Zoran about not having an affirmative argument on the alternative, how the left addresses crime is defund because it's an understanding that throwing money at the institutions that currently exist does not diminish the rates of crime. Throwing money at certain other kinds of interventions that are first order problems um, like poverty, lack of education, lack of mental health and drug treatment centers, et cetera, actually does lower crime. And if no one is talking in those terms, like I think Kenneth Mejia did a great job in part because he just put the billboard up and said, this is the percentage of your budget that's going to the police. Does this feel appropriate to you? This is the percentage of your budget that's going to mental health care, needle exchange services. Does this, does this ratio feel appropriate to you? And let people contend with those facts on their face and to trust that the public knows instinctively that there's something wrong with that and that the correlation that is in their mind between police funding and lower crime rates is a, is a, is a fiction. And so I do think that sometimes the worrying about whether defund as a slogan is toxic prevents the left from putting forward an affirmative case. And it stresses me out that so much energy seems to be about discussing how bad that specific three words are, as opposed to making the case for why everything that those three words actually represents are the left case for the alternative to um, the system we have right now, which is obviously isn't working. I, I'll, uh, I want to give you the last word, Ross. Yeah, so I I agree. And then why not just talk about funding mental health services? I mean, again, I don't want to debate the defund slogan forever, but why instead of talking about cutting police funding, you just say, I want to fund mental health services. I want to fund psychiatric beds because that is the real problem here. You have the homelessness problem and this crime problem in New York to an extent. And a lot of it is tied to mental health. You have people on subway platforms who should not be there who are not afraid of cops because they are so deep into psychosis, it does not matter. If you have 10 cops standing around them, they're gonna attack someone on the subway, right? I mean, these are people who should be getting humane treatment in facilities, they should have housing, they should not be sleeping on subway cars or sleeping on the street. So for me, it's about, I and I agree with Zoran, talking about all the things we want to do. We want to increase mental health services. We want to increase housing. We want to you know, create these humane wraparound services for people. I guess I never understood why that also meant you have to cut the police department by 50%. Because I guess I, I the way the budget works in New York City, at least, the, 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 take education, for example, the Department of Education budget is almost $40 billion. The NYPD 
with overtime and all these other things is around 10. So if you shrunk the NYPD to, to zero and, and threw it into something else, it would help these other things. But the reality is you're going to need more than 50% of the NYPD's budget to create a mental health system that works for people in certainly New York state. It's going to cost a lot of money. So I agree in that we should really just be talking about the things that government should do for people and less rely on this negative messaging of cut the department. You can cut the department if you want. And the department has a lot of waste in the pensions for officers who retire at 40 are, are, are a bit nuts and they have this military grade weaponry. But again, to, to me, that's a sidebar. The real problem is the lack of mental health services, the lack of affordable health care. You go back to universal health care and the fact that psychi you know, psychiatrists don't take Medicaid, uh, that, that getting treatment is, is pretty much impossible unless you're getting thrown into an ambulance. You know, These structures, the left really has to attack and, and try to solve because certainly the center is not doing it. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And again, I don't care about what you, word you use, but you do have, I mean, like you do have parts of the left that are, are rooting for Caruso. I responded to, to Jank Uger on Twitter uh, yesterday because he said that he was going to uh, be voting for Caruso over Bass in the mayoral election. And who are saying that actually police funding needs to go up. You have Stacey Abrams running on, I want to increase funding for police. So it's not, I think it's actually more leftists arguing to fund the police harder along with Joe Biden, and the rest of the democratic party establishment than it is at this point, anybody really, I mean, obviously there are people who are advocating for cutting police budgets as well. They should places like New York might not be as much of an issue. I'm not as familiar, but cities out West like Los Angeles has something like 50% of their entire city budgets going to police and with what effect. Um, so, you know, I, this is a whole, obviously could be a whole other conversation. Um, but I do go, yeah, being, go ahead. Being, yeah. being, a, being a leftist who roots for Caruso over Bass is bizarre <laughs> to me. So yeah, I, I, mean, I, I think if you're doing that, you, you're not on the left. I mean, I, I, in that instance, I mean, that, that's absurd to me, but I, I very much agree with Ross. If, 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 if <laughs> yeah. Caruso, you're not on the left. Um, I think that what one, I know we're just wrapping up, but I do think that Ross, what you're speaking to is that there are two aspects of that call. And I, one is a belief that safety comes from the investment of other services, right? We're talking about mental health, and we're talking about beds, and we're talking about social services. We're also talking about preventing eviction, the, the root causes of homelessness, all of these kinds of things. I think the other side is the belief that police interactions create mm -hmm. the absence of safety for individuals. That's where the demand comes in to cut a reliance on that, on the police as an institution versus just saying, keep it there and then increase all the mental health services and homeless funding and all of that over there. There is a belief, one that I share, which is that the more that you engage with police, the less likely you are to be safe over the, over, over the longer period of time, for most especially for specific communities of color. And I think that that's where the, the demand comes to reshape our funding structures. I do agree with you in that the demand is, it's, it, it doesn't explicitly talk about the rest of what you would do with funding to create safety. And it leaves that in many ways to the imagination, which then is the responsibility of so many of us to make explicit, this is where you should be fighting for things and to make explicit to people, this is not an austerity demand. Mm -hmm. This is not a demand about, you know, cutting for the sake of cutting. It's, it's a demand about a belief in safety actually originating through the provision of other services and danger and violence often originating through the provision of this one. That's very well put, Zaran. Uh, very well put. I appreciate both of you and your willingness to engage on this slightly adjacent topic, but one which I think really did um, carry some sway in uh, New York State. I appreciate you both. Ross, tell the people where to find more of your excellent reporting. So you can find me at New York Magazine at, at The Nation. I do a column for Cranes as well. Or you can find me on my Substack, rossbarkin.substack.com. That's just my first and last name, B-A-R-K-A-N. And read me and follow me on Twitter at Ross Barkin. I, I cannot endorse doing so more. And Zoran, where can the people find you? You can find me reading all of Ross Barkin's <laughs> in my inbox. Start, start a every, sub stack. 
on, on every site that happens to have a paywall <laughs> lost his tail. Um, you can also find me on my own social media, which is at Zahran K. Mamdani on Twitter, on Instagram. Um, and you can also sign up for, for our newsletter. And you can also find me as an elected official here in Astoria. So if you have any issues, please come to our office. Yeah, I mean, we, you have to come back at some point because I do think that we haven't talked enough about the kind of the progressive wins in the context of this cycle and especially what progressives are doing in New York State, making like some pretty significant inroads. And I'd like to have more clarity on what the agenda actually is so we can continue to track it because, again, not putting this on you, but there was some frustration when we saw what happened with Medicare for All in L.A. and how much we should really believe in and invest in even very liberal states ability to carry agenda items like this over the finish line, even when you have like Bernie adjacent people like Ash Kalra leading the charge, what happens at the end of the day? So we want to be prepared and to also support you in those efforts and whatever we can here at Bad Faith. Thanks to everybody for listening. You know, this is a free Thursday episode, but you can get an additional Bad Faith every month at patreon.com slash Bad Faith podcast. We appreciate your support. Take care of yourselves. And as always, keep the faith. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast. That's patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.